Welcome to everyone on this Lord's Day as we meet together to worship the Lord our God and welcome to those uh, who may be watching the live stream or the, the recording later on. Uh, there are just uh, a few notices and uh, mostly on the back page with one or two extra ones as well or where the notices are written if it's not on your back page. Um, Matt is helping at Cooper's Edge Baptist Church. Uh, the minister there, John Kerr, who's, who preached here a few weeks, a few weeks ago, the, uh, the minister's off sick, so uh, Matt has stood in to help him. Uh, it was due to be David Pfeiffer. There's some sickness over at Wadden as well, and some isolating, so uh, it, it worked out much the easiest thing if I would take the service here today. Many thanks to the folk who've helped with the distribution of leaflets. You can see there's just two uh, rather lonely looking little piles there. So if uh, anybody would like to help them out and distribute them, that would be uh, much appreciated. And uh, everybody's welcome to uh, stay for tea and coffee in the hall after the service. Just to note that uh, in the hall we are still wearing masks until we're actually sat down at a table drinking our tea and coffee. Next Sunday, the 5th of December, no, sorry, today, the 5th of December at 3 p.m. is the youth Bible class, and 6 p.m. today, the service is led by Reverend Matt Fawkes. And on Sunday the 12th, Matt will be leading and preaching in the services on 10.30 and 6 as usual times. And if you would like to follow the services on uh, live stream or like to follow them uh, as a recording, the, uh, the link's there on the church website. Wednesday, the 8th of December at 1.30, there's the Mums Bible Study via Zoom. And uh, do contact Megan if you'd like more information about that or you'd like to join in with that too. And at 7.30 on Wednesday, there will be the midweek meeting. Uh, it's led by me. And we'll be continuing in our studies in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Friday, the 10th of December, 4 to 5, there's Jam Club as usual. Uh, Saturday, the 11th, uh, not advertised here, but there is prime time. Uh, that's at 10 o'clock and that's in the church hall. Uh, do chat to Stephen and Audrey if you'd like to come to that. Um, it's for those in the, uh, the, the prime of their lives uh, or a little bit older. Uh, it's uh, yeah, our, our seniors meeting. And then Saturday the 11th of December at 4 to 7, there's an open house at the Fox's place and that's 55 Oldbury Orchard and everybody welcome to that. And a few advance notices for the Christmas services Sunday the 19th at 6 will be the carol service. Christmas Eve, there's a children's carol service. That's here at 4 to 4.45 in, in church. On Christmas Day, it's 10 a.m., so half an hour earlier than normal. Christmas Day, the 10 a.m. service. And Sunday the 26th of December at 10.30 and 6 as usual. I think that's all the notices. Unless anybody's recognised that I've missed any. The Lord calls us to worship from Psalm 30. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. Let's come to the Lord in prayer, then we'll sing our first hymn. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord God, it is good to sing praises to your name. It is good to give thanks to your holy name. Lord, we recognize that you are holy in all that you do, that you are good and that you do good, that there is no wrong in you or coming from you at all. And so, Lord, we have a confidence to hand ourselves over to you, our good and gracious and loving Lord God. Thank you that we may come into your presence. Thank you, O Lord, that we are always in your presence, for in you we live and move and have our being. But on this special occasion, Lord, on this day that you give to us, and together as your people, we come to you. And we pray, Lord, that you will accept our praises and our thanks. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Let's stand and we'll sing our first hymn, the version of Psalm 103. Oh, bless the Lord, my soul. O oh Lord, we rejoice that we can call you Father. And we rejoice too, Lord, to know that you have a fatherly care and a fatherly love for us. We worship you, O oh Lord, as the creator of all things. We give to you that which is your due. But we also give to you, Lord, the worship of our hearts, that which is our joy. Father, thank you that we may come into your presence. We have no rights, O oh Lord, and no right to come into your presence, no right to address you even as, as Father or even as the Lord God, Creator. But we thank you that you sent Jesus into the world to be our Saviour. And we thank you too, Lord, that through him and by the work of your Holy Spirit, we thank you, Lord, that we may be yours and that we can come to you. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you have broken down that dividing wall which separates us, that you have nailed to the cross in Christ all of our sinfulness and all of our bondage, and we are now free to worship you. Father, we do pray that you will forgive us our sins. 
Lord, we read your word and we recognize in your word the things that we have done wrong or the things that we've omitted to do. Lord, our consciences are at work and our conscience is pricked and we recognize, Lord, that we have sinned against you. And so we ask for your forgiveness, Father. Each of us, Lord, asks individually, but also too, Lord, we as your church ask for your forgiveness for the wrongs that we have done against you. Lord, we thank you that it is your joy to forgive us. We thank you, Lord, that like the, the Father in the parable, you come running to us uh, to, to receive us back again into your love and your kindness. And so, Father, we rejoice in that forgiving love. And we rejoice that we have a Saviour in Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's hear these words from the prophet Isaiah. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Come now, the Lord says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. The idea that the, the Lord is speaking here through the prophet is that when wool is dyed, and when it's dyed in such a way that it's, it's done permanently, it's impossible to get the dye out of the wool. And so when wool is dyed crimson or scarlet, it's impossible to wash it out. But the Lord says there is no impossibility with him. And though our sins are like that scarlet that is dyed into our whole being, our whole personality, the Lord is saying it can be washed out. There is a greater power. And that power is the blood of Jesus, our Saviour. May the Lord bless his word to us. And we now have an opportunity to bring of our gifts and our tithes and our offerings for the Lord's work. They're most welcome to. Hi. Hello. 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 I've got a few pictures and I want to tell you about something that I'm going to be speaking about later on in the sermon and we'll talk about it in the reading that we have. Um, anybody have, have any idea what that's about? That's right, that's brilliant. Well, well deciphered, yes, well seen. Yes, it's the man rescuing a cat. Well, the cat's gone up the tree. He thought he'd just go up there and have a look, see what was up there. And oops, all of a sudden, he gets himself stuck. Have you ever seen a cat in a tree? You know, they get themselves stuck sometimes. And sometimes you have to call the fire brigade out to get them down again, because they can't get down. Well, that man is rescuing the cat. So we're going to be talking about rescuing man's rescuing the cat who's got stuck up the tree. Now, there's something too. I better tell you what that is. It's not a donut. 
It's a life buoy. Anybody see? <laughs> it's a life buoy. It's floating in the water. Have you ever seen a life buoy? You see it at the seaside sometimes. Yeah, yeah, you do, don't you? You see it at the seaside or you see it by lakes or ponds. And if somebody falls into the water, what you do is you take hold of this life buoy and you throw it out to them and the life buoy floats and they grab hold of it and they can be rescued again. So that's another way of rescuing people. And here is the emergency rescue, it says. It's the emergency rescue van. They've called out, see the little blue lights flashing away. They're dashing down the road. Perhaps they're going to a, a mountain to get somebody who's stuck. Or perhaps they're going to get somebody who's fallen into the water like before and to get them out. It's an emergency rescue. And sometimes rescues have to be emergencies because nobody knows when they're going to happen. And so sometimes the people who do the rescuing have to be really busy and really on the ball to get out and do it. Do you know what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us? Yeah. He died on the cross, that's right. He rescued us. Our Lord Jesus Christ rescued us as well. Not from being stuck anywhere, but he rescued us by dying on the cross for us. So in our reading, which is coming up in a minute, and in the sermon later, we're going to talk about a rescue. We're going to talk about when King David had to rescue a lot of people, and it was an emergency. He didn't have much time to think about it, but off he went. He rescued them. So try and follow the reading, and if you want to know any more, ask your mums or your dads later on, or you can even ask me if you want to. Thanks for listening. Let's turn to that scripture reading now. It's 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 30. And it's a long chapter, so we'll read it in two parts. We'll do verses 1 to 20 now, and then 21 to the end later on. So 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 to 20. Now, when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire, and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives had also been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? He answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue so David set out, and the six hundred men who were with him, and they came to the brook Besor, where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and four hundred men. Two hundred stayed behind, who were too exhausted to cross the brook Besor. They found an Egyptian in the open country, 
and brought him to David. And they gave him bread, and he ate. They gave him water to drink. And they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit revived, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. And David said to him, To whom do you belong, and where are you from? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. We had made a raid against the Negeb of the Cherethites and against that which belongs to Judah and against the Negeb of Caleb, and we burnt Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Will you take me down to this band? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this band. And when he had taken him down, behold, they were spread abroad over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped except four hundred young men who mounted camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back all. David also captured all the flocks and herds, and the people drove the livestock before him and said, This is David's spoil. The Lord bless his word to us. Let's now come to pray for ourselves and for others. And we should, of course, remember the Ludeman family in our prayers especially. Uh, I, I guess everybody will know that Lynn Marie passed, passed away, passed into the Lord's presence in the early hours of Friday morning. And so we should pray for Dion and for the children too. Uh, there's no uh, date set for the funeral yet. Uh, it's rather early days for that, but uh, we'll keep you informed of when the funeral might be and of uh, other proceedings that might be. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Oh, gracious Lord God, Thank you for all of your mercies to us. Thank you, Lord, that we can each of us count and recount to you and to each other all of the ways in which you have been good to us and all of the ways in which you have shown your love to us. Lord, we thank you for your care of Lynn Marie. We thank you, Lord, that we could pray often for her and that you heard our prayers. And we thank you too, O oh Lord, that... Uh, she is not now suffering. And we thank you too, O oh Lord, for your help too to the whole Ludeman family. We do lift Dion to you, Father. We lift uh, Mia and Leo to you too. We pray, Lord, that you will draw near to them and that you will give to them great comfort. We pray, Lord, that in many small ways and perhaps large ways too, they will know that you are a heavenly father to them, that they will know that you uh, care for them and love them beyond all of their thoughts and imaginations. Father, we do commit to you any who may be sick. We pray for them, Lord, and pray that they may, they may draw comfort from you, that they may know you as the God of all comfort. And we pray, Father, that if they're in pain, that you will ease their pains. We pray too, Lord, that they may recover. But yet, Lord, we know that it is not always your will that we recover from illness. And so, Father, if this is the case, then we pray that you will give to them strength and great patience and great fortitude and forbearance, and that they may recognize that you uh, care for them 
uh, despite what may be happening to them. Our Father, we pray for our daily needs. Thank you that you are so generous to you. Thank you, Lord, for these tithes and offerings that we could present to you. And that we do, Lord, and say that we uh, offer them to you as a token that everything that we have comes from you. O Lord, of your own do we give you. Father, we pray for the work of missions. We uh, commend to you those who have gone out from us uh, or who are due to go, uh, from uh, uh, not just from the, the congregation here, but from the, the wider church that we know of. We pray, Lord, that you will go ahead of them and prepare the ground, prepare hearts to hear the word of God. And Father, we uh, do especially commend to you the, the former communist countries of Europe of, and in Eastern Europe. We pray, Lord, for their ongoing recovery. Even now, Lord, and even after many years of abuse that they have suffered, we pray, Lord, that they may be made whole again. Lord, most especially, we pray that they may turn to you uh, to seek from you uh, grace and help and strength at this time. We commit to you, Lord, those who may be uh, working in these countries, who may be work, working for, for the kingdom in these countries. We commend to you the, uh, the church at Mangalia, Lord, and pray for your strength for them and your help for them. And so, Father, we do bring our prayers to you, seeking you, Lord, uh, to answer our prayers in the way that you know will be for our greatest benefit and for your, for your glory. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing again. It's John Newton hymn. And dost thou say, ask what thou will? Lord, I would seize the golden hour. I pray to be released from guilt and freed from sin and Satan's power. And we'll take up our reading in 1 Samuel again from verse 21 through to the end of the chapter. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David and who had been left at the brook Besor. 
And they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children and depart. But David said, You shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He has preserved us and given into our hand the band that came against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays with the baggage. They shall share alike. And he made it a statue statute and rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. When David came to Ziklag, he sent part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, Here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. It was for those in Bethel, in Ramoth, the Negeb, Ramoth of the Negeb, in Jatir, in Arawa, in Sifmoth, in Eshtemoa, in Rakal, in the cities of the Jehirmalites, in the cities of the Kenites, in Horma, in Borashan, in Athak, in Hebron, for all the places where David and his men had roamed. David here found himself in a very distressing situation, a situation that required immediate and energetic action. He and the army of 600 had returned to Ziklag to find it burnt to the ground in their absence by the Amalekites. All the property gone, all the families gone, everything gone. Well, the scripture has a way of writing large the things of life. And though we do not face the same dire circumstances that David did here, yet we can face distresses and difficulties and painful experiences at any time of our life. What can the scriptures say to us in this case? What are some of the things that David did that we find him doing in response to the tragedy that happened? Well, I'd like to look at three responses. Uh, first of all, that he strengthened himself in the Lord his God. It's verse 6. Then he prayed, verses 7 to 8. Then he gave glory to God, verse 23. First of all, let's sketch, sketch some of the background to the text. David had been taken from following the sheep. Uh, and the following of the sheep had been a, a shepherding experience for him in order to prepare him for a greater shepherding experience to shepherd the people of God. And he was anointed by Samuel. Uh, Saul was still king at the time, but Saul had failed as the leader of the people. And David went into the service of Saul after the famous fight with Goliath. But Saul became jealous of him. Saul became suspicious of him. His paranoia came to the top and he outlawed him. And Saul tried to hunt David down. And there attached themselves to David, a band of men and women, uh, who the scripture describes as, it's 1 Samuel 22, and everyone who is in distress, and everyone who is in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him, and he became captain over them. Perhaps not the men you would go out to recruit for your army, but they gathered themselves to him. Uh, and the Lord used that gathering to him to provide David with this army, small army of 600 men and their dependents. But then David's courage failed him. And we could read in 1 Samuel 27 that he said in his heart that one day he would perish by the hand of Saul. And so he went to take refuge 
in the land of the Philistines, at this place Gath, uh, with Achish the king of Gath. And Achish was only too ready to receive him because the Philistines were traditional and long-term enemies of the people of God uh, up to this, this date. And so David went off with his 600 men and their dependents and Achish gave him this town Ziklag to live in. And David and his men would secretly make raids on the enemies of the people of God. And on this one occasion, they very nearly went to war against Judah with the Philistines. But here the good providence of God stepped in, and the Philistines sent him away back to his town of Ziklag. And it's there that we pick up the account in chapter 30. David's return to the town, destroyed by this marauding band of Amalekites. It was a three-day journey home to Ziklag from Gath. And David and his men would have set out in high spirits. And on the third day, as they got nearer, they might have expected some of the lookouts from the town to, to come out and to greet them and to, to wish them well. But it didn't happen. It must have been eerily silent. And then perhaps as they rounded a hill, they saw smoke. They could smell burnt timbers and the burnt hides. And as they got nearer, they recognised it was Ziklag that had been burnt to the ground. And so, verse 3, So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burnt with fire. And their wives, their sons, their daughters had been taken captive. And they wept till there were no more tears left in them to shed. And in their distress they blamed David. Let's see what he did. He strengthened himself in the Lord his God. He set aside the immediate circumstances of the trouble. It must have required a huge effort of will. He took his eyes off the burning, smouldering ruins and he looked up to God. He took his eyes off the scenes of desolation. He took his mind's eye of, of what might have happened to the women and children. And in an effort of will, he looked to God, a necessary effort of will. He got the bigger picture. He was able to place himself in God's presence. Maybe, I don't doubt, that confession of sin and repentance were necessary for him. He had acted in unbelief. He had taken shelter with the enemies of the people of God. He very nearly found himself on their side against Judah. He had led his band of followers in the wrong way out of Judah to the Philistines. And more immediately, he'd left the town and the women and children unguarded. And perhaps his sins crowded in on him, as so often is the case in times of distress or trouble. He confessed to God and sought and received forgiveness. And he looked up to God. He looked away from the immediate situation in an effort of will and he looked up to God. To the God who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, who's marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. Behold, the nations are like a drop in the bucket and are accounted as dust on the scales and he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. He is all sovereign. Nothing happens by chance in this world. And though in times of trouble or distress we do not know, may not know what is happening, but it's an immense comfort to us to know that God is in control, that we're not in the mercy of blind fate or a universe that's running out of control 
about to run us over and crush us. He sees that God is all loving. Yes, as a father, he would discipline us, but it is as a father. We know that God is love with a deep, deep love of us. And he shows us that love. He expresses it to us in so many ways. It's not as if God loved us and was powerless to act, as we so often feel. But he loved us with an everlasting love. God cannot love us more or less. His love for us is a fixed thing in his own nature. It, it's infinite, like all of the things of his nature. He cannot love us more than he does, and he cannot love us less than he does. His love for us is not like so often like our love is for other people, that we love the people who please us, or we love the people who do good to us. God's, yes, we can please the Lord, we can displease him, but we can please the Lord, but it does not increase his love for us. He's our Redeemer. In Old Testament times, they, they look back to this great act of redemption that was the Exodus. But now we consider the great, far greater redemption of Christ dying upon the cross for our sins. And like, like the children heard, that is God's rescue of us, his redemption of us. See the power of Christ. He still the storm with a word. See his compassion. He moved, was moved by a man with leprosy. He weeps at the grave of Lazarus. See his love. He died for us while we were yet sinners. And he was raised to life for our salvation. Christ is the rock of our salvation. He has rescued us if we are his. In times of distress or trouble or hurt, let us steady ourselves upon the rock of our salvation, upon Jesus Christ our Lord. Take your eyes off the immediate circumstances and look to Jesus. Know that he is your Redeemer and the one who has rescued you. So David breathed again. Worn out from weeping, he looked up and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And then he prayed. In these circumstances, uh, immediate, urgent action was needed. But David prayed. He stopped to pray. He'd learned not to trust his own instincts. And his instincts as a military man at this time would have been to take his band of 600 and to chase off after these Amalekites without a second thought. But he'd learned not to trust his instincts. Instead, he prayed. He sought God for what to do. And as it turned out, well, he did have this hotline to heaven, uh, which we don't have, but as it turned out, it was the Lord's purposes for, sent, for him to set out after the Amalekites. In, in times of difficulty, of trouble or distress, we need to pray. We need to take time to pray, even if urgent action is needed from us. Know that the Lord hears and answers our prayers. We come to pray to him. He strongly desires to hear our prayers. The Lord works in our life situations through prayer. Uh, even though we don't know what to ask for at times, especially at times of distress, he gives us according to our need. Even though we can't see an answer to our situation, he can, and he will work out for us whatever that answer is. He doesn't always take away our painful circumstances, but he's able to change us in those circumstances. Remember Paul's thorn in the flesh. It wasn't like a splinter that he picked up in his finger. It was like a stake that was being driven through his whole being. And he cried out to God three times. 
But the Lord said to him, My grace is sufficient for you. He wouldn't take it away, but he would give Paul grace, strength to bear with it. So David prayed, and his strength came as an answer to his prayer. Times of trouble grow our prayer life. Isn't that so? Haven't you experienced it yourself? Times of trouble make us pray. It's a huge relief to be able to come to God in prayer. Is it not wonderful to be able to pour out your heart before God and know that he listens? Uh, the prayer of the psalmist, let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. And God's ears are. He is attentive. So David looked to God. He prayed. And then he gave glory to God. After the fight with the Amalekites, after the rescue operation, uh, he returned to uh, the brook Besor and was returning back to Ziklag. In context, context, he needed to have acted immediately. And it could have been that God would have routed the Amalekites in the same way that he did the Assyrians outside of Jerusalem. Uh, Isaiah the prophet and Hezekiah the king prayed to God about this impossible situation when they were being besieged by this huge army of the Assyrians. And the next day they woke up and they were all gone. All dead bodies, it says. God could have done exactly the same with these Amalekites, but he didn't. He used a human agency. He used the agency of David and his men. Uh, the Lord sometimes does act completely by himself, uh, but often, and dare I say maybe usually, he uses a human agency. And in 1 Samuel 30, David's army of 600 men were the human agency. They were more like a band of, mis of malcontents. They were all in distress. They were all in debt. They were bitter in soul. Uh, but they gathered to David, and he became captain over them. But now they set out as one man in pursuit of their families to rescue them. And so they did by the Lord's providence. And they got to this place, the brook Besor, must have been the boundary. They got to Besor, and 200 of them were so exhausted uh, that they, they, they couldn't really go on. Uh, and so David left them there. They, these 200 would have become a liability to the others as they traveled on. And so they left them there. But on the return from the victory, uh, they, these 200 greeted the returning army with great enthusiasm. It was a great victory uh, with reduced forces. There were just 400. There's a, a, an interesting note in the text that says, uh, all the Amalekites were wiped out except for, and we'll not bother too much about these, 400 young men who escaped. So David's army of 400 was, was like nothing in comparison to all the Amalekites. And David could have said, haven't I got a great victory? Didn't I work a great victory with just 400 men, these reduced forces, small numbers? But in fact, what David did say was, you shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He preserved us. And gave into our hand the band that came against us. We have faced great difficulty. We have prayed. God has given us the victory. What shall we do then? We give all due credit to God. We give him thanks. How did that work out here? Well, we see David's great generosity. He gave away much of the spoil to his friends in Judah. But he was also very generous to his own men, and especially the 200 who had been unable to go with them into the fight with the Amalekites. He was generous towards God. Generous towards God in his praise of God for the victory, and that spilled over to him being generous towards man as well. He acknowledged God before his men. And so God acknowledged him uh, to his men, to the elders of Judah, to become the king later on. 
David's praise and love of God was mirrored by his love of his men. There's something very Christ-like about this, isn't it? Um, there's something very Christ-like about David's love of his little army. He's no local warlord. He's an honourable and righteous man full of justice. God has rescued us and we need to give glory to him. I may be from a specific circumstance, but we need to know too that he's rescued us from the life of death and misery, from a life that is like those smouldering ruins that Ziklag would have been. We need to acknowledge it that Jesus did it all. But wouldn't it be horrible to love God like this, but to reject our neighbour? and to hate them in effect. Our love of God spills over into our love of man. So David made it a statute in Israel that day that for as his share who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. And he made it a statute and ruled for Israel from that day forward to this day. Well, this day, uh, that statute has come down to us here today too. In principle, think about Paul's collection for the poor in Jerusalem. Or think about Paul's writing to the Corinthians church. Uh, if the ear should say, I'm not an eye, it's no less part of the body. If we should say, well, I'm not very good at doing this or that, we are no less part of the body of Christ and we no less share in the victory of Christ and we no less share in the rewards of Christ. Those who go down to the battle share alike with those who stand very necessarily by the baggage. We are all part of the body of Christ and individually members of it. The weakest and the poorest are no less a part of the body of Christ. The ones who are able to do much less for whatever reason than the strong and the fit. They all, we all, share together in the victory of Christ and in the reward of Christ. So David needed to make an immediate response to the situation. It needed immediate energetic action. But he strengthened himself in the Lord his God. He prayed. He relied on other people too. And God and gave God, but he gave God all the glory. When we face times of trouble or distress, we should stay ourselves on the rock of our salvation. We should pray. We should remember to give all the glory to God after the victory. And let's give thanks for Christ's great rescue, rescue of our souls from captivity and death. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we may always turn to you in prayer, whatever the circumstances. Help us, Lord, to look away from the circumstances of life that are causing us trouble, even now, Lord, and to look to you. Help us, Lord, to rely upon you and to give all the glory to you. And Father, we thank you again for that rescue of Christ, who's rescued us from death, who's rescued us from the punishment of our own sins. We praise you, O Lord, for this. In Jesus' name. Amen. We sing a, a version of Psalm 60 now. It's a psalm which recounts uh, a time of great distress of the people of God, where God seems to have overthrown them and cast them away, but yet the Lord gives to them the victory in the end. Let's stand to sing this version of Psalm 60.